Your gifts will make a room for you, for sure. Hey everybody, this is Joshua Lewis with The Remnant Radio. Thank you so much for tuning in today. The topic is revival history, but before we get into the topic, I want to give you a quick update of who Remnant Radio is and what we do. Remnant Radio exists to teach theology. We're embracing diversity, having pastors and teachers for different churches and denominations to come on and help us uh, dig into theological topics. And then we want to empower you for practical ministry, because any theological conversation we have, any any conversation we have on this program, we want it to be relatable, uh, to encourage you, to empower you, to make a difference in the sphere of influence that God has given you. Uh, and today... With me is my co-host, Jeff Gray. Jeff, how you doing, man? I'm splendid. So, so uh, no, so okay. I feel like this is deja vu. I feel like we've done this before. We've done this once <laughs> before, right? We've done the the revival we history with Daniel, it. yeah, and, and we try to Skype him in, yeah. But because technology is failed us miserably, Skype is not quite there yet. No, no it's yet. not. It's, it wasn't your fault. Why is it? Why is it that I CNN think, uses well, that? Well, doesn't I have a problem. I think that Zuckerberg. Like figured out what we were doing, and he oh, got don't. pretty peed. Last <laughs> time, like, no, they ain't using Skype on my Facebook. Last time I said Zuckerberg screwed Zuckerberg. something up. Zuckerberg. All of our videos started getting flagged. Oh, really? Yeah. So, well, I was saying Zuckerberg's awesome, and he understands exa- that Skype is that's way I, inferior to Facebook. That's what that I heard. That's yeah, what I heard. Yeah, it just can't keep up. So, anyway, so to my left, uh, you're right. If you're watching the program, this is Daniel Norris. He's a guest with us, not a guest to me on any level. Um, I, Daniel was my youth pastor from 12 to 21. And 21's not youth, but I interned under wow. you, went to Bible school. Grew up already. Um, huge, huge impact. He's, he is my pastor, really. Wow. I mean, uh, when I think about it that way. Wow. Uh, That's a long time. Yeah. I mean, you think through, I mean, most most people that have had a youth pastor in their life, I mean, they're there for just a couple of years. Oh, yeah. Stepping stone ministry, eight months. That's it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But Jen, right? Jen and I, but Jen is my wife. Uh, we, we saw youth ministry not as a stepping stone, but truly as a call. Mm-hmm. And so when we came to Dallas Fort Worth to be with Steve Hill in the church plant, we told him we want to sow a decade of our life into youth ministry. We really felt like, you know, if, if you're going to be a youth pastor, you ought to be there for the entirety of a youth's life. Mm-hmm. And so we accomplished yeah, that. That's, that's powerful, good. man. You know, and we, we've seen so many tremendous... I mean, when you think through people like yourself, Josh, and others that are around the world now yeah. that are doing ministry... You know, it's just, it's amazing what God did through through that house. And so I'm honored to be able to be a part of this and to see what you guys are doing. We're honored to have you, man. I mean, honestly, out of all the guests that I can think that to have on, to, to show you what we're doing and to be able to have you on and glean from the wisdom that you have, it's going to be, it's going to be a fun program. So I, I want you to give all of your shameless plugs of who you shameless are, plugs. how people follow you. I like calling them shameless <laughs> plugs because that way, if you plug yourself, you can do it in a shameless way. Because I was asked, authority. I was asked, I was asked, to, asked to do it. I, want I didn't do it. didn't want to do this, but you you asked me yeah, to do it. Exactly. No, um, you know, really, we've we've been honored to work with churches, ministries um, uh, around the world and the United States. But the one thing that we're really the most known for is is revival, I and mean, that's my heartbeat. Um, I, you, I'm not excited about football. I'm not excited about you know entertainment. But we start talking about revival, revival history. You know, all my antennas go up because that's just that's my heart passion. My life was forever touched, changed in the fires of revival. And I believe that if you would have an encounter with the Lord, everything would change. I knew that was true for me. And so kind of off that, um, we've, we've written two books that I would love for you to pick up, especially those that are watching this right now. Um, the first one, Receptivity. This one is to unlock a lifestyle of hearing God's voice. Number one question I'm ever asked is, how do I hear the voice of God? Yeah. Number one question I'm ever asked. Oh, I'm asked two questions. I won't talk, share the second one, but the first one is always, how do I hear the voice of God? Because honestly, inside of us, every single one of us believe that it must be possible. People believe that there's a God that wants to speak to us, and he does. He is always speaking. He's never silent. And so this book is about how to unlock a lifestyle of hearing God's voice. And um, 
there's a story that we share in here uh, about a time that I was with my mentor, and he was sharing a story about when he was with his mentor, Leonard Ravenhill, great revivalist. If you've never read Why Revival Terries, you must oh, pick man. that book up. Oh, yeah. Mandatory. It Where is. Are the it is. Of God? Yes, yes, there. yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Um, so Steve is with Ravenhill, and they're in uh, Ravenhill's study. And Ravenhill says to Steve, Steve, I want to share something with you. And so Steve gets up and he starts walking closer to, to Ravenhill. But Ravenhill says, Steve, closer, closer, Steve. And so he, he gets closer to him, but he says closer. And so he continues to draw in closer until he has literally got his ear right up to the lips of Ravenhill. It's uncomfortable, if yeah, you can imagine. Awkward, I mean, it's a right? very yeah, awkward yeah. position, but that's the position that Ravenhill wanted him in. And then he whispers into Steve's ear this. He says, Steve, the Lord has secrets. Yeah but he doesn't shout them. He says, you've got to live your life in such a way that you can hear the still small voice of the Lord. And when Steve shared that with me, he, he just kicks back from his chair and he lifts up his hands and he says, Lord, and this is at the end of Steve's life. I mean, Steve, he's, he's preached a million, but here he is. He lifts up his hands and he says, Lord, I want to be so intimate with you. And, you know, and there in that moment, I'm convicting the fact that here's Steve who's still contending for that place with the Lord to be close to him. And so here's the deal. God is always speaking. People say, why can't I hear him? It's because we're unwilling to put ourselves in an uncomfortable position and to silence ourselves long enough to be able to hear his yeah. voice. And so this book is all about getting yourself into that position. It's not a how-to book. It's about a position that you've got to find. Hmm. And that's where you find the Lord at. And then the second one, this is our newest one, Trail of Fire. Um, this, this book right here. Uh, Trail of Fire is 10 stories, 10 true stories from 10 past moves of God. Uh, this book is a revival starter in your life. If there is an ember, a flame inside of you, in fact, we'll probably share some of the stories from this tonight um, in, in this broadcast. And so you're going to want to make sure that you stay tuned for the entire thing. But I'll share a few stories from this book. Um, this is just a call to break free from the dull, dry routines of religion and become a catalyst for revival in your life, your family's life, your city, your community, and your church. And so uh, both those are available on Amazon. Uh, you can find out more about our ministry at danielkingnorris.com or trailoffire.org, which is the year that we just wrapped up. And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah, we'll have tons of questions. Jeff, yeah. tell, tell, well, tell me about I think it's interesting because you have the book, The Receptivity. Yep. And... We just did a show on mysticism, and you said, "Oh well, this you know." I'm glad you didn't ask me to do that show because no, you you <laughs> nailed it. That's exactly what we just talked about. Really? Yes. Yeah. 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 And so and that's kind of what the essence of it is. So yeah. man, you don't you get to give yourself more so, credit, bro. Yeah, and, 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 and that's and that's really you know having having sat under Daniel's ministry um, again a very large portion, if not the majority of my life. Um, that message of hearing God has always, he used to sit us um, in our chapel times. We, we would have a Tuesday night or something, no, Tuesday morning, um, and we would go up to the church, and he would have us sit in a chair and recite a scripture over in our mind over and over for an hour. And we would just sit there and think about that scripture over and, and not let any other thought come into our head and take every other thought captive and just let that thought roll around in our head um, and allow it to consume our minds and our thoughts. And then he would have us come in and and uh, it, it, the, the this exercises. Is no, no, this oh, is this is I when was I was saying, when like, I was the leadership. Youth? Yeah, the but leadership. Youth? But we did. Was we, we, we would do stuff like that also with our youth ministry. There were times yeah. that we would take moments and I would just have everybody get alone and just silence yourself. You know, and just spend five minutes of silence just yeah. trying to keep one thought and then talk about how hard was it when all the distractions started coming and learning to practice the presence of the Lord, yeah. really which is good. something we don't talk about. We don't, yeah. you know, we don't talk about how to meditate and how to spend time with the Lord. And that's, and that's why, you know, this topic of revival is so, so uh, near and dear to my heart is because when we talk about revival, we're talking about normal Christianity, right? We're, we're all talking about getting yeah. back to, oh, Acts chapter two, yeah. but that was normal. Yeah. Right. Receptivity, yeah. hearing God, experiencing God—that was normative Christianity, and we've lost it along the way. Absolutely. So we're really reclaiming this stuff. Yeah. It is, it, most people call, um, you know, especially if you're you're part of a revival culture. Oftentimes, the term that they'll use is, "Oh, you go to that church." Mm -hmm. You know, and when they say that church, they're talking about you know that church where all that that stuff happens, um, as if it's weird. The truth is, none of that stuff is supposed to be weird. It's supposed to be normal. What's happened is we've been so far away from a normal mm. Christian experience that it's whenever the, the church starts to look normal, people call it weird. Yeah. You know, what we try to do is make the church look more and more like the world. But I'm convinced when the world comes into our churches, they don't want it to look like them. Man. No, they don't. They they have an expectation that this is going to be different than the place that I left. And oftentimes they come in and we've done everything that we can to dumb down church and make it more palatable to them. 
so that they're more comfortable. But all along they're saying, listen, I, wasn't tr- I was trying to escape that life. You know, I'm wanting to come to a place where I'm going to be impacted by something that's going to transform and change well, me. They come to meet well, with God. that's why the NFL's taking over Sundays. You know, yeah. Because they're looking for excitement. They're looking for something mm-hmm. that's going to satisfy and stir their heart and move their emotions and get them caught up and, and captivated. Yep. And I have we're a- like, no, no, no. Everyone just calm down. Yep. Yep. <laughs> no dancing. <laughs> we have a friend that's, uh, I, can't, I can't name his, his name or the place that he's at because he's a missionary in a country. He, he would lose his life, but he, he sent out, he sent out <laughs> yeah. a, a, a newsletter I love to throw us. casual stuff out there all well, the time. He would. He would die today. Yeah, he would, yeah. so um, he, he was uh, doing some missions work. He's not allowed to proselytize, which is just sharing his faith openly um, because it would get him imprisoned or worse. And he's out in a, in a Buddhist <laughs> temple playing worship music because that's called, it's not street preaching. Right. It's, uh, what do you call it? When, when you're out in New Orleans and you're, you're a showman. Oh, yeah. Uh, street, street performance. performance. Street performance. Yeah. Yeah. He's a street performer. That's yeah. what he was doing. And, you know, so people are coming up, listening to them worship. And there's a young man who comes up and he feels a piece. That he ha- I mean, he's about to commit suicide. He's just down on his. L- okay. So he comes in, has this encounter. And, and then they, they spent five hours just t- listening to him, listening yeah. to his problems, listening yeah. to his life story. Still can't tell him about Jesus. And then they ask him to come into their home. Right. Yeah. And, th- and they're playing worship in there so he can experience that peace again. And as he's experiencing that peace. He begins to weep and he begins to start saying, hallelujah, how he loves us. Hallelujah. How, words he's never heard before. Wow. He, he's having an encounter where he's literally in heaven, like he's having a vision where he's seeing a man sitting on a throne and myriads of people just singing hallelujah, how he loves us. Yeah. And that's yeah. revival. Absolutely. And, and that's normal Christianity. Yeah. Those are the kind, you, you hear a story like that and you're like, that sounds like something that I would read out of the Bible. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Something yeah. that's unusual that makes you take notice, which is the way, you know, when the, in the very first day of Pentecost, you know, something unusual was happening. And all the people from all the nations, they're watching and they're saying, what is this strange thing? And that gives Peter the opportunity to be able to speak into that and say, hey, listen, these people aren't, they aren't drunk oh, yeah. as you suppose. Mm-hmm. You know, no. Um, you know, this is this is the fulfillment of scripture. And from that, he's able to see, you know, uh, to, to preach the gospel. You know, thousands are saved in that day. That's the normal Christian experience. And so we should always be expecting supernatural things. You know, um, this past year, uh, for those of you that don't, we traveled the nation this past year. We got, you know, our, our, we, we took our family of five. I've got a beautiful family. My wife and I've been married now for almost 15 years, and then we've got a, uh, a 10-year-old girl, um, a six-year-old son, and a, and a, f- a four-year-old son. And so we, we took our entire family, sold everything that we had, and we moved them out of our home here in Dallas into a 300-square-foot motorhome. And we traveled the nation. We crisscrossed the nation. We went a beautiful from- <laughs> home, by the way. Some people who are like, oh, that's not much of a sacrifice. Like, it was a sacrifice. It's oh, a no, it was. It, was it wasn't my- like the hood, right? No, it was no, like, no, 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 no. <laughs> In fact, on trellofire.org, you can actually look at the house that we sold. It was my wife's dream home. Beautiful. She is a chef. She loves cooking. She had a chef's kitchen. We had loved having people over. It was literally our dream home. The Lord blessed us with that. Um, in fact, I was thinking the other day because we've been looking for houses, and I'm like, man, I can't even afford to buy the house I sold <laughs> just yeah. two years ago here in the Metroplex. Um, but we took the entire year. We traveled 50,000 miles last year across the nation, circumnavigated the nation, uh, really just trying to put our finger on the pulse of what is God doing across the land. And uh, so blown away as we got introduced to what I feel like the remnant across the nation. It's like God allowed us to see how vast and wide this army is across the nation that is genuinely contending for a move of God. Sometimes we wonder, are we all alone in this? The truth, no, we're not. There's, there's more than you realize. There is a lot um, of, uh, we call them the remnant. They're out there and they're coast to coast. Um, even in, people talk about the, the frozen chosen in the, you know, in, in the Northeast. <laughs> Um, no, I found some churches up there that are vibrant. I Come would move on. my family there Praise tomorrow God. because they are burning with wow. the fires. It's a prayer culture, um, and they just they love the Lord. We saw some incredible things. You talk about not being able to proselytize. There's a place that we went to. I won't tell you where the location is at because I wouldn't want to get them into trouble. But um, after we ministered there on a Wednesday night, they said, hey, can you come with us to the public school tomorrow? I'm like, I'd love to. You know. And so we come into a public school, and we preached the gospel Come on. to 600 students during the middle of the day, mm. gave an altar call, and we're laying on hands um, on students there. We're seeing the power of God move. I mean, we're, we're prophesying over these kids' life. They're getting impacted by the power and the presence of the Lord. And people are like, my God, that happened on a public school campus? Absolutely, it happened there. And you say, how did that happen? The school system said, everybody's given up on us. And we just reached out and said, can somebody come somebody and help come us? Help, can somebody man. come wow, help us? And awesome. they reached out to the church, and the church showed up to the door and said, listen, we're going to be who we are. Mm-hmm. And it's made a difference in that school. Amen. You know, and again, these Man, are the kind of the, 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 we, we talk about revival history, about what God's done, but I'm sharing what he's doing <laughs> across the nation. Amen. Hey, so we've got a couple questions. We already got some here. questions in. So, I think one of them was actually in sarcasm, <laughs> but we'll ask it anyway. 
I saw that one. That's yeah. Luke Gajari asking yeah. what's because you said the, the the most you know the yeah, first I'm question I was asked, and he said, "Well, questions. what is the second question you're asked most?" Yeah, I won't I won't go into that one. All right, Luke, we're not going to humor you today. <laughs> it would be anyway. So, uh, <laughs> Jacob asks, you know, Jacob he says, as a student uh, of revival, you know how many more uh, of God's of the moves of God have ended in you know sin, scandal, all these yeah. things, burnout, of course. Um, some finish the assignment with integrity. What do you feel are the keys to effectively steward a move of God and finish well? Maybe that's jumping ahead a little much, but you know, no, I you think tackle it when you want. I, I think it's a fantastic question yep, and one that you've really got to look at because whenever you look at revival history, oftentimes you will see in the aftermath of a move of God, um, they fall apart. Um, I don't believe that that is God's divine intention for any move of God. I believe that whenever he puts his, and the truth is we're coming, talking about coming back to normal. Mm -hmm. You know, revival simply defined to me is the Lord's arrival. It's the moment that he's allowed to ascend and take the throne inside of his church. And why would you ever want that to end? Right. Why I, I will never forget Steve Hill coming by uh, my office at Heartland uh, one day, just wanting to chat. And we were talking about an article that a mutual friend of ours had written. And in it, he talks about this. He says, I went down to Brownsville during that revival. And he says, and it was a wonderful season in my life. And I could tell that bothered Steve. And I said, what, what, what's bothering you about that? And he said, it's what he said about revival, calling it a season. He said, Daniel, that's what people do. They, they make it into a thing. They book in it. It has a beginning and it has an end. A weekend revival. Yeah. It's, it's like, you know, a week of revival. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. Yeah. You know, how do you schedule? Those schedule are usually man-made revivals. You know, we yeah, put if, a tent in the field and call word, a revival. If, if we could <laughs> schedule a revival, let's go ahead and just schedule one for America. Hey, say let's we're do in it now. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, but this is what Steve said. He said, Daniel, revival's not a season. Revival is God. They usually how end for a reason, but it's not never, it's, it's, it's rarely good. You yeah, know. it's it's because what happened. And this was Steve. Steve taught us this. He said, in order to sustain a move of God, you got to have three things, and that's this. It would be holiness, hunger, and humility. Yeah. He says, in every move of God, you will see that somewhere along the way, it was either the holiness that was no longer being addressed, or the hunger. Or the humility. Somebody got prideful. They got yeah. arrogant in that thing. And whenever they begin to elevate themselves, listen, there's only room for one name and a move of God, and that's the name of Christ. And so, yeah. you know, if, that's good. if, if, <laughs> you know, you, you're trying to elevate yourself, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to come to a close because it's no longer about him. It's about you. Yeah. You know, and people aren't coming to a move of God because they want to experience you. They come to a move of God because they want to meet with yeah. him. Well, there's moves of God that I've seen that were just awesome. They were amazing. And they were preaching the gospel. People were getting born again every night. Signs, yep. wonders, miracles breaking out. And then when it shifted to healing and like only healings yeah. and people need to get healed. Oh, everyone just come because we're getting healed. Man, it's like within a week, it was like just kind of died yeah. off, you know, yeah. because it stopped being about Jesus yeah. I and, think the and the gospel. When the you cross. see the long running moves of God in history, you know, Brownsville lasted for five years. Um, Azusa Street was four and a half years. Uh, the Welsh Revival was three years. The Hebrides Revival was three and a half years. I mean, these are pretty long moving moves of God. Every single one of them had this one particular mark, and it was repentance, holiness, and salvation. Yeah. When you see souls being saved, it keeps the fruit you know, pure, yeah. because people realize this is all about seeing people get right with God. And so when you see that fruit in a move of God, you realize that it's healthy. But the moment mm -hmm. that it stops getting about that and it starts moving on to other things, you can tell it's getting ready yeah. to come to a close. We were in a revival <laughs> years back and in about lasted about three years. And, our, and we talk about the day that it ended. And it was, we had someone, we asked someone to come speak that we probably shouldn't have. And they're yeah. not bad. Yeah. They just taught on something more about like inner healing and stuff. And so everyone was like experiencing the glory of God. And then one day we all went, oh yeah, but I was really hurt by my Ooh. dad. <laughs> That's a different show topic. <laughs> yeah. And that then it was like, wah, 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 you know, yeah. <laughs> there yeah. goes Holy Ghost, you yeah. know. So o oftentimes what happens, I believe, is somewhere in that, whenever you let the focus no longer be outward, yeah. which is yeah. evangelism, and you start putting it back in on yourself. And that's what we did. We went, we all went yeah. in. That was kind yeah. of the teaching is go yeah. inward. And yeah. And then at that moment, it, it, the word I've always used, it becomes incestuous. It becomes Ooh. all about us yeah. instead of reaching the lost. And at that moment, the fruit's no longer there. That's yeah. good. Is that too hard? No. no. The word incestuous is a <laughs> powerful word. Um, it's offensive, but it's... it's <laughs> Quite. <laughs> I think of cartoons that my kids watch. He invited an evangelist on. It's a hard on. word, you, but it's the right <laughs> word. Um, so you, ma you made this statement about uh, holiness, hunger, humility. Yes. So we talk about original, normal Christianity is what we would call revival. What what happened? Wh which age did we lose? Having studied revival history, having having studied church history, can you can you put your finger on a moment 
Can you put your finger on a on a time frame where maybe maybe this is where we lost, where we fell off the bandwagon? I, I don't know that you'd ever be able to find one specific moment because it's the same thing that's true for the corporate is also true for the individual. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, with any single one of us, oftentimes there's never one of us that just makes one massive decision that causes us to fall off the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. It's always a, a gradual decline. There's some decisions that you're making along the way that causes you to come to a place that you've sacrificed so far along the way that you don't realize that, man, I, I departed a long time ago. Yeah. And so it's true you know, that it, it's, it's subtle. Because if it was something that was significant, I think we'd all recognize Yeah, the devil it. never just jumps out of the dark corner and goes, let's all do this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's the real subtle things that kind of get you along the way. And so it's true for us as individuals. It's also true for us corporately. And so, you know, I, I believe that as a pastor, that as an evangelist, mm -hmm. one of our greatest calls is to steward the anointing inside of the house. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is to be a diligent steward. We're all servants. We all serve him. And so we're called to steward the responsibility that he's given us. And part of that is to steward the hunger, to mm -hmm. steward the holiness and the humility inside of the house. And those are just three checks. And then I would add one more to that, and that would be honor. And so, you know, it's, it's are we honorable to one another? Are we honorable to the Holy Spirit? And are we mm. honorable to those that are coming in? And if we don't see that culture of honor in there, then there's an adjustment that needs to be made. Likewise, we look at the holiness level. You know, are we beginning to get slack in the way that we live our lives, you know, and I'm not talking about living under rules and religion. You know, that's that the discipline that that killed so many of us growing up. That's what I grew up in was a lot of religious discipline. Yeah, I'll never forget the moment that I had an encounter with him, and at that moment everything changed. Why? Yeah. Because I became devoted to him, and then from that I wanted to discipline my life. But when you start to notice that there's areas that you're beginning to slip up in, you start realizing that you know we're getting a little lax in here. Then what we need to do is press in to get our face closer and closer to the that's Lord, good. because the more and more you get closer to him, and the more and more you want to be like him. And so that's the response I wanted to hear. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, I think so often, you know, uh, we hear when you're slipping up, yeah. go get an accountability partner, go yeah. get a yeah. software on your computer, I call go it, get yeah. a, I call it bootstrap theology, put yeah. the bootstraps and get holy already. Yeah. You know? Like, yeah. but, but really the only response to holy living is getting our eyes on Jesus. Yeah, here's the deal. Um, holiness is a word that we would not know. Was it not given to us by the Lord? It, there's nothing on that's earth good that you would be able to look at and to be able to say, okay, now that's holy. Because holiness is everything that he is. It's the pure essence of who he is. And so in order for us to even know what it is, he has to impart that to us. Mm -hmm. And so in order for us to be holy, I have to come into an encounter with his holiness. And so there's no way that I can discipline myself to be holy. This was the whole reason why he gave the law, was mm -hmm. to get people to realize, listen, you can try your best. You're going to mess up. You're That's never right. going to be holy. You're never going to—your your best is still filthy to me. And so what you have to do is come to me and let me begin to put that fire on the inside of you, and holiness begins to be perfected. Why? Because you've touched me and my holiness has touched you. And the moment that I have touched you, then his essence and his nature begins to work on the inside of mm -hmm. us. And so that's that's the key, is that you've got to get your face into his face. And mm -hmm. so, you know, again, as a steward in the house, we've got to look at that. And then as well, um, the hunger. You know, are we passionately pursuing him? How's our culture? One of the things that I did this past year, as we were traveling the nation, we worked with 80 different ministries across uh, the land. It was by far the most significant, successful year in our ministry. I'm blown away by what the Lord allowed us to do. We saw so many lives touched and changed. Um, and so we really feel like we got a really good picture mm -hmm. of what's happened in the church world. But one of the things I started doing was every church that we'd go to, and then all the churches in the area, I'd jump on their website. And what I was looking for was when's their prayer meeting? It's an interesting thought. I would have never had it before, but I started going on the websites and say, because I could find out when the Sunday morning mm -hmm. service was. I could find out, you know, how to be a part of your small groups. I could find out how to be a part of everything that's going on at your church. But what was never <clears throat> addressed was the prayer meeting. You know, Ravenhill said this. He said that you show up on a Sunday morning, you know, you find out how popular the, the, the church is. You come on a Sunday night, how popular the pastor is. Come, you know, to the prayer meeting, you'll find out how popular God is. Yeah. You know, it's whenever solid. when you show up, you know, for the Man, pulpit on a good. Sunday morning, you're speaking to men. But when you show up to the prayer meeting, you're speaking to God. Right now, that's important. That's where you begin to steward the the anointing in the house and the hunger inside of the house. And so, here's the questions that I would ask a pastor. I'd say, okay, when's the last time you talked about your prayer meeting in a staff meeting? When's the last time you visit? Are, are your are your staff members showing up at the prayer meeting? And would they come if you didn't require them to come? It's good. 
I mean, some good questions that you should be asking yourself because they're at the heart of what Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer. And it's one of those areas we don't even address, don't even talk about. We kind of take it for granted. We leave it in the hands of an 86-year-old sister, you know, who's who's a saint woman of God. She knows how to pray, but she's been praying for the last 10 years, 20 years inside right. of your church, and nobody else shows up. Listen, you're not stewarding the hunger in your house. What you're doing is you're providing an experience on Sunday morning thinking that's going to be enough to be able to take care of people, but they need to have an encounter with And him. I think every believer would tell you that's not enough. No. We, we would all say, man, Sunday was great, and by the time Monday afternoon hits, we're like... When's Sunday going to get here? <laughs> yeah. You know, because yeah. we do those encounters. Yeah, you've got yeah. to have that face to face. And so the, the, the place that you really begin, and <laughs> Raven Hill would say this, you know, um, he said, Brother, with all that getting, get unction. What is yeah, unction? No, I hardly right. know. I hardly know. But I know what it's not, or at least I know when it's not on a man. Where do you get it? Wow. You get on your knees, and you begin to pray, and you contend until you get an anointing from heaven on your life. And the only place that it comes is is in the prayer closet. Our producers are like they're bucket a bow show to the back. They're like <laughs> they're like throwing paper up yeah. there. They're like whoa. Okay, so so hey, we're p- pulling it on to a bit onto revival history because I think we're laying a foundation. Yep. Uh, of, of really of words here of just a vocabulary that is consistent across the board when we're talking about revival what that is how we're passionate about how we steward this thing um, let's because, uh, one of the the guys that we have on here frequently he, he made a statement he's he's going through his his doctorate uh, right now he's, no I'm sorry his doctorate he's getting his master's yeah and as he's going through he, he had recently studied a piece of uh, church history and just studying what revival historically has looked like across the globe a lot of people think of white European Western revival. They think of, you know, when we talk about revival, we think of w- Wigglesworth yeah. and, and Finney and Parham and George Whitfield yep. and, and Wesley and, and uh, Jonathan Edwards and all, all these guys that are just Western East, you know, William Seymour, Charles Parham, all these guys. And that's, that's who we think of when we think of revival. Um, but, but really, historically, revival has always taken place across the globe. And even though, and I think that's, a, you answered the question with a lot of wisdom. And you said, I don't think there's a moment we can mark at where it was lost because ultimately God has kept a remnant yes. consistently who's madly in love with him well, historically biblical. throughout the earth. He will always leave a remnant. That's right. What the yeah. word says. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And I think that we're seeing that grow. And that's I think that's why we're catching wind of it is we're like, wait a second, this isn't normal. You know, just just every day in and out, reading the word with no power, praying to, to a wall that doesn't respond. This is not normal. Yeah. And I think people are coming awake well, to isn't, that. Isn't that prideful to think that if I'm not experiencing revival in my church and in my city, then it must not be happening God's anywhere? not moving then. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. really that's really arrogant and prideful. Um, here's one thing that I have learned. It's for one is that the kingdom of God has never been in retreat. There's never yeah. been one day that the Lord slowed down, let down, or let up. He's always been advancing and always been on the move. And so from the first day until today, he's always <laughs> been on the move. Yeah. From the first day so the of Pentecost. The Baptist until now. Yeah, was, <laughs> it's been forcefully advancing yeah. and forceful men take hold of it. And so there have always been forceful men and women and groups across the nations mm. that are contending for more. Um, in fact, one of my favorite quotes, it comes from A.W. Tozer. I don't know if I can find this real quick, but I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase it. Tozer says this. He says that in order to be filled with the Spirit of God, the desire to be filled must be all-encompassing. It must, for the moment, be so great mm. that it crowds out every other thought. It becomes yeah. the single most important thing in that moment. And then he says this, for you have as much of God as you actually want. Now think yeah. about you have as much of God as you actually want. And because it's and his that, good will to give us the kingdom. Yeah. yeah. That's, right. And that's he what I pray that. a lot. I pray the Lord, and I'll, I'll, depending on where I'm at, I'll say, God, I want you. But I know I don't want you like I need to want you. So help Man. me want you like I need yeah. to want you. And I want to <laughs> desire him more today. Give me hunger for more hunger. Than the even, day you know? before. And when so. we begin to realize that he makes so much available, but yet we settle for what we've known or settle for what we're comfortable with, yeah. instead of realizing that no matter what we've tasted and what we've seen, there is a whole lot more. Mm-hmm. I mean, even in this moment, as we begin to talk, I don't know if you feel this, but I, I get in this moment right here, we start talking about him and I feel his presence and I begin to realize, God, you're yeah. here. But he's never taken his mind, though I'm thinking about him, he's never taken his mind off me. Amen. That's good. You know, and he's desiring more from me. And now it's like, God, I want more of you. But then he's saying, I've always wanted more of you. Hmm. And I'm making more of myself available to yeah. you. And that's available every single moment of every single day. There's more available right now, and there's more available tomorrow, and there's more available. But what we do is we settle for where we are. And I believe that in order to move into that, that, that move of God, that all you and I really have to do is just come to a place of yielding. Yeah. You know, which ben to me, me Lord, right? Ben, that was the key to the Welsh revival, you know. And you talk about revival from across the nations. Um, the, there's a really great story that I tell in the book, um, shameless plug. Uh, 
<laughs> of, of the um, revival that took place in Cape Town, South Africa. I love this story because Andrew Murray. Oh yes. Who Andrew Murray wrote over 220 books. He is celebrated in every evangelical circle that's out there. I mean, he is loved. I mean, his Gold. his book on absolute surrender a must read. His book on Holiness. you know um, at at school of discipleship with Jesus a great read. I mean, he talks about prayer and fat. I mean, he's a phenomenal writer. Andrew Murray comes to the Cape of South Africa with this deep belief that God has sent him there to bring revival to the Cape. Now, when he gets there, it is a spiritual wasteland. I mean, they literally write in there that the Dutch Reformed Church that had come in and kind of set up church there, it had been a hundred years, and what they were so religious in their thinking, they would only allow Dutch to be preached inside of the churches. Nobody spoke Dutch. And so nobody has a clue what's, what's even it's being shared. Yeah. But this is religion. Catholic liturgy. Yeah, this point. is this is religion. This is religion saying it has to be done this way. And so all that has produced after a hundred years is a spiritual wasteland. Wow. There's no spirituality whatsoever. And so he comes for this appointment at this church in the Cape of South Africa with this belief that God is sending him there to bring revival. Now his experience with revival was um, the revival in Scotland, Dundee. You know, um, uh, Robert Murray McShane. And so it's the very orderly. It's very reverent. And so his thinking is, is that this is going to be what we're going to see. This is my expectation, a very white European controlled revival. Yeah. <laughs> and so he comes down to the Cape and he starts, he, he takes his appointment on Pentecost Sunday, prophetically Oops. believing I'm going to make, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to make a point. He preaches on revival for nine months. There's a 16 year old girl in his congregation. Her name is um, Ms. Vanderbeek. And she's, uh, she stays on her uncle's farm. And when she goes out there, she gets such a heart for the African workers who are being treated as just heathens. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're being treated as, you know, slave labor and, you know, it's, uh, just people to be conquered and colonized. And she has such a heart for the African worker that she starts a prayer meeting there on the farm, believing if my pastor's talking about revival, I want to see revival come here because all I've ever heard is cursing come out of the mouth of the workers and all I see mm-hmm. is the drunkenness. And so she wants to see a change. And so she starts a prayer meeting with her cousin and um, an 80-year-old black man. They called him Saul the prophet. And so they just start praying, and they pray for weeks. And she writes in her journal that as she could feel the move of God coming, that it felt like she had gone into the pains of labor. This is intercession. Um, Weird talk for most people, but she felt like she'd gone into the pains of labor for an entire week. She didn't eat. All she could do was just pray and intercede. But on the very last day of that week, revival broke out there on that farm, and every single of the workers within a single night came to that schoolhouse. And it was raw. It was emotional. It was chaotic as they're pouring out their heart and their soul to the Lord. Andrew Murray gets wind of what's happening. He wants to come because he wants to see. I mean, it's like finally this that I've been preaching and looking for is happening. He comes to that and he sees the raw emotion being poured out. He sees a chaotic environment and he tries to call it to order. I mean, he's like, order, order, order. God is a God of order and God yeah. is not in this. And Saul the prophet comes up to him and says, you try and build a wall around this if you can. <laughs> yeah. And so he throws his hands up and walks out frustrating saying, God's not in this. Wow. God is not in this. He came preaching, praying, asking for a move of God. Now, that's not the end of the story, thankfully. Yeah. You see, <laughs> good. the fires on that farm spread from the farm all the way into the city. It takes one week, and it takes over the youth meeting on a Sunday night, um, about 64 mm-hmm. youth. And this move of God comes in, and it comes in such, in such power. And again, raw emotion. Andrew Murray is summoned. He comes into this youth meeting, and he tries to call it to order, but he can't. And so he's frustrated, and he's trying to figure out what is going on here. Another week passes, but this prayer meeting is continuing to grow. More and more people are coming into the community. They're coming from the farms. And so it breaks out in his church on a Saturday night. He opens up the start of the meeting for prayer, and as they're praying, uh, the, the young man who was overseeing the youth, he writes in his journal, he said, I heard what sounded to be the sound of, of a roar and like a thunder. It started off in a distance, but I heard it getting louder and louder, mm. and louder and louder and louder until it entered into the room, until everybody was overwhelmed. They're all on their face. They're weeping. They're crying. Again, Andrew Murray is trying to call his church to order. He's still fighting this mm-hmm. thing. And a man comes up to him and says, sir, I think that you're the pastor of this church. He says, I've just come from the United States where they're experiencing a great awakening. He says, this is exactly what we're seeing there. This is the Holy Spirit. Let it burn. And Andrew Murray throws up his hands in that moment in a place of absolute surrender, which this is the impetus to his book, Absolute Surrender. Yeah. And there in that place, he yields mm-hmm. to the Holy Spirit. That move of God 
shakes not just that church, but it burns all the way through the Cape of South Africa. They said within a three-month time period, you couldn't find a home that wasn't touched by the fires wow. of revival. That is you see, amazing. God comes however he wants. Yeah. Man. He comes and pow- don't you feel the presence? Yeah, of God? I really do. <laughs> yeah, I, I hate watching Christian television where they're like, "I just feel the spirit of God in the studio right now." And I wasn't doing an impression oh. of anyone in particular. I'm just saying. Yes, you were. But, well, but I really, I like for well, real though. I'm getting well, like it's, the. It's interesting because that's that's what we can do. We we encounter God the way we've encountered God, yeah. and we expect it to always be that way. Yeah. And I remember, you know, we I went up to Toronto Airport back yeah. in the day. And and just got blasted by the love of the, of the father, and I didn't even we didn't even know what that meant at the time, and yeah. now we just throw it around as you know, yeah. good good father, reckless love. We're singing all these songs; they're totally normal. And back then, we were so like holiness. Leonard Ravenhill was my dude, and he would pray for revival. Yeah, but at, near the end of his life, he actually visited, and he said, "What you wouldn't think that's not his right shtick." Right, he's like, "This is what I've been praying for." He saw it and went, "It looks nothing like I thought, but this is what I've been praying." <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's awesome that when we can recognize revival, it's so important that we, we just don't get bogged down and, and put uh, in a cookie cutter. You know, yeah. it's not going to be this one thing every well, time. Well, we, we tend, what we do is we, we tend to think that God has to move the way that we've experienced him in the past. Yeah. God's not contained or restrained, and he's certainly not put himself inside of a box, but we try to. We try to make it fit into what we understand, but he's beyond our understanding. I mean, this finite mind will never be able to wrap itself around the infinite of who he is. And so for me to think I've got him figured out and I can tell him how he can and cannot mm. move is to put me in a position to where I'm trying to be him. Yeah. yeah. And that's not my position. He can do whatever he that's wants, two, however. Right? Don't create a graven image. Right? <laughs> that's that's exactly <laughs> it. it. This is his church. You know, this is his creation. This is what he's, you know, we, we're his people. And so let him move how he wants to move. And, uh, you know, just have an expectation. God, we, we're hungry for more and more and more of you. And Lord, I don't want to, I don't want to predefine how that has to look. Mm-hmm. You know, I was, I was listening to a, um, um, a video just this past week of of somebody who would look at us and say that we are so far out in left field that we're not even saved. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. you know. About, um, but I'm listening about the, that same guy recently. I'm, I'm listening. <laughs> I'm listening to him as he's sharing, and he's talking about being, you know, uh, just a middle schooler, and he's reading books from like Hudson Taylor, and the power of yeah. prayer. Ian, Ian Bounds. Um, you know, uh, and just reading about the experience of what he would call almost this mystic experience with the Lord. And it's this thing that, you know, he deeply longed for, but that wasn't his experience. It wasn't his, it wasn't something that he knew. Mm -hmm. And so what he did is he's sharing how he gave up on that pursuit and realized that that wasn't biblical. And I'm thinking, my word, you have been so robbed your entire life of the one thing that's made life for me fulfilled. And that is absolutely knowing that when he says it's a relationship, guess what? It's a relationship. That means I can truly know him. Mm-hmm. That it's, you know, um, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds, present tense, out of the mouth of God. And so it's not just about what he said. I'm thankful for what's been said and what's been written, what's clear and what can be read mm-hmm. in scripture. But I'm also thankful that I can hear him. Yeah. That he can speak, that I can spend time with him and he can share because I don't believe that he's silent. I believe that he's always speaking. And that's been my experience ever since I met him when I was 19 years old on the altar of that church. Mm. And now 22 years later, my experience has been every single day there is more to experience yeah. from him. And that's what I want. And that's more. why we want to do these shows because we're trying to, we want to provoke people. We always, exactly. I was talking to John after the last show. It's like, he said, man, there's so much more to say. I was like, yeah, but people's hearts are pricked tonight. And, and this is the same thing. I mean, and it's in the same vein in all reality we're kind of we went from like a more personal like intimate revival with mysticism if you want to call it, you know yeah. i don't even like that word anymore actually <laughs> you know yeah, yeah, yeah. to now like now the corporate revival yeah and it's like that encounter with the lord and i'm just i'm getting stirred right now god, i mean literally god is speaking to me right now yeah. personally yeah. i'm listening to you and yeah. it's just like oh, man, and all this stuff here, so. here's the thing that you know um because i remember what church was like for me before the 90s and a lot of what we're all experiencing in the church today, we owe a lot of debt of gratitude to those that pioneered oh, some yeah. things Come in on. the 90s, um, you know, of getting back to what was normal. Where there's some excesses, where there's some abuses, absolutely. Sure. But I'm thankful that especially a lot of the, you just said it, a lot of the words and a lot of things that we use today that we take for granted um, for, mm-hmm. for us was a brand new experience. You know, all I knew before revival was religious Pentecostal church. I remember coming to church and being able to tell you 
if they sing this song <laughs> in that key, they'll extend the song service, they'll call it a move of God, and we won't have any preaching, and we'll say that was revival. If they play it in a certain key, you know which lady's going to stand up and prophesy. Yeah, right? I could tell you who it's going to stand <laughs> up. I could probably give you the word in tongues they were going to give, because almost every single syllable was on repeti- was repetitious from the weeks before. You know, <laughs> well, and I knew, new thing I knew who would give the... In- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I knew who would give <laughs> the... In- the last thing, but doing another new thing. I, I knew who would give the interpretation. It was just... <laughs> it was religion, because at that point in time, I didn't really know the Lord. What I knew was a religious experience, and so I'm watching things happen, and to me, I'm crazy. <laughs> critical of all of it. And then revival breaks out. And there's a freshness and a newness, you know, on, on that 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 service that scared me. Man. I mean the fear it of God. You, huh? The the fear of God, the all of his presence, you knew that whenever you stepped into the house that he was there. And because I was living my life so far away Excuse from him, me. I didn't want to be in that environment. It was uncomfortable, but yet I kept coming for three months. The Lord worked on me until I got radically touched in an, in an altar. And uh, I'll never forget that. that It was a Saturday afternoon. We were at a conference. And I came down to the altar and lifted up my hands just in full surrender. And there wasn't anybody laying hands on me. And I'm glad it happened this way because I'm Mr. Thinker. I'm Mr. Critical. I yeah. try to analyze and Skepticism figure everything out. Yeah, you know, I'm a freshman in, in, in college and um, the power of God comes over me. I lose the strength and the ability to stand and I just collapse to the ground. And there was nobody laying hands, nobody pushing. I just, I'm on the ground, I'm pins to the floor and I'm literally thinking to myself, this is like something I've seen on Benny Hinn. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm trying to wrap my brain around what's happening. As I'm trying to figure that out, God starts speaking to me. You know, people say, what was that all about? I don't know. All I know is that he humbled me there in that moment. He started speaking to me about the plans, the purposes, the call on my life that I was running from. Yeah. And then to me, you know, and I've always said this, it's not about whether or not you fall down or whatever you experience. The question is what happens after the counter. It's how you get up. You know, if, if he's truly touched you, then there has to be a change. Mm. And the change for me immediately was this. Every single day after that, I would wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning with the Lord speaking to me, him wanting to spend time with me. Wow. Now, at 19 years old? Yeah. Yeah, 5 now, o'clock in the morning. Normal, that ain't the Come flesh. On. Yeah. That ain't you the know? devil, that the flesh. <laughs> but that was, that was my revival encounter in that moment of coming to the place of realizing that he genuinely wants to know me. Amen. And every single day since that, it has been a pursuit to know more yeah. and more and more and more of him and help yeah. try and bring people to that place. So we, we're we actually, so we're, we've got about probably 18 minutes left in the program. That's it. So I know it just it that, flies by. That, this uh, is the quickest show. I, I mean, know. Seriously. We need, to, we need to get to a, one or two more stories. So let's, let's yeah, get we to got that. Yeah, we got but a question here. Like, what's the places in the USA are in revival? Like, so Brandon wants to go and he wants to know. He wants to go. <laughs> yeah. So I'll let you I'll let you answer that question. But I do want our audience to uh, to follow us on Facebook. If you're new, if you're following Daniel, come with us on Facebook. Hit that like, subscribe button. We have content just like this every week that we're cranking out. Next week on Monday, uh, we have uh, uh, Scott Harrell, uh, who is uh, from Dallas Theological Seminary. He's coming on to talk about the Trinity. We've actually set up uh, a, tri- a Trinitarian debate, honestly. So we're, we're thinking about having packing out our sanctuary again 800 seats we're gonna pack it out so uh tune in next week to find out some content about that if you want to if you want to check out that's that crazy it's gonna be cool you didn't tell uh, me this uh it's a surprise and then <laughs> Not um, anymore. and then and then uh, n- the week after that we have uh dan mcclain we have uh chris estrada on monday awesome and then and then the day after that on a tuesday it's a, it's a strange day to have joel stockstill is gonna be on the program so we've got a lot of really chris really and great joel. but we do have to warn like warn the, the viewers that i won't I won't be there for for Joel. Stocks That's true. On, on Tuesday, so it'll be a really good show. Works up. No, <laughs> it's messed up. No, the, messed the, up. the prophet is showing up and Jeff is leaving. Yeah, he, <laughs> yeah. I have to work. That I always day. hated so. it whenever a prophet, a true prophet, would show up at the church. Yeah, even when I was a kid, the prophet would Just show up, and I'm out, like, oh, right? I was afraid oh, he's going to call me out. <laughs> No, and that's and that's that's what you're saying is is like when you know that a man or woman walks in in revival when revival shows up it's God has shown up yep. and and there's a fear of the Lord that a righteous I I can't tell you how hard it was to grow up in Heartland as long as I did and not be regenerated like it took I mean it was it was I mean to use the expression accurately it was hell to show up to church every week and and to be in the presence of people who are on fire for God and hiding from the Lord yep. you know it's it's awful to know that I'm at war with God and yep. I just and you know, and let me just point this because what you just shared right there, I think, is the crossroad that the church is in right now. Because especially in a lot of our charismatic Pentecostal churches, what they're saying is, is to reach someone like you at that time is we've got to bring the Pentecostal experience we down. Gotta down. We've got to dumb it down to be able to reach you. Yeah. Where I'm like in the other direction, I'm like, I want the presence of the Lord to be so powerful 
that for one, I'm convinced that you'll be drawn in there, but there's something in that. Again, your proof that coming back. Why? Because there's something here that I don't have. And I recognize that though it challenges everything in me, I want that. Mm. And so, you know, I'm, I'm convinced the world wants to believe that when you walk through the doors of a house that bear the name of God, that they can meet with him when they come in there. What they don't want is just another good <laughs> service, another good experience, another good yeah. message. What they want desperately is to hear from him and to meet with him. Amen. That's good. So, okay. We've got to get a couple stories in there. So, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, episodes on revival history, we've, bar- we've barely escaped it. We, oh. We're talking about Cape Town. Give me, give me favorite revival story if, if cape town isn't if isn't already the number one give me a number two number three uh favorite one is uh the hebrides revival um uh, duncan campbell duncan campbell hebrides revival this breaks out december the 7th 1949 um this is uh just a few years after world war yeah, two that's, that's actually yeah. two years after D- yeah uh, which is very uh, important Harbor. really important because it gives you an idea of the of the climate of where things are at especially because um the Hebrides is the northwest island chain above Scotland. So this is okay. literally in the area where the wars you know, were fought in that area. So it's very close to home. And so uh, what happens in the Hebrides is uh, there's two sisters, 86, 84-year-old, Peggy and Christine. Peggy is blind. Christine severely riddled with arthritis. Uh, they've grown up in their church, and their church has gone into decline. There are no young people in the church whatsoever, and they get such a heart and a burden to pray for their church, that they literally pray in a move of God. And I love this story, and the reason is is because whenever you look at it, you don't find that man marketed, manipulated, or did anything to contrive it. It simply was that two sisters got a burden, and they prayed. I, I genuinely believe that revival comes as a response. It is heaven's answer to the passionate, persistent cries of God's people who've made up their mind, I'm done with the status quo. Ravenhill said, as long as you are content to live without revival, you'll continue to remain without revival. Mm-hmm. They got discontent. They prayed, heaven answered. And so when this revival breaks out, um, they, boy, how do you shorten this one? Um, they, they've prayed, and in, the, in a time of prayer, they've gotten a word from the Lord, Isaiah 43, uh, verse um, uh, 8. Um, is that right? 43 verse 8. Uh, anyway, I'll pour out my spirit on dry ground. Yeah. And um, with that prayer, they just begin to press in. Christine, she's the blind sister. She gets a vision. She sees the church packed wall to wall with people, young people, old people, a man behind the pulpit that she didn't know who she was. She'd lost her natural eyesight, but spiritually she yeah. can still see. She sees what God's about to do. And so she shares this with her pastor. Her pastor says, you're hearing from the Lord. And so she challenges him to follow them in prayer. And so he calls a prayer meeting with all the elders in the church. Again, boy, you want to get a fire start in your church? Pastors, if you're listening, you're like, what do I do to grow? What do I do to get a move of God? Start a prayer meeting. That's it. Just start right there. It's like, is it really that simple? Yes, in a place of just start a prayer meeting. Show up and start to pray and get a hold of heaven. Why? Because revival comes as a response. We're not talking about like a tame, like chill out. No, I'm talking let's get a hold let, of heaven. Like, let, let's listen to one guy preach and then no, we're all going to no, I mean, no, pray we're just and we're going to go home. I mean, that, was, that was the intro to my sermon on Sunday was uh, Paul in, in Ephesians 3, 14 uh, through 20. He says, for this reason, I bow my knee before the Father, from uh, whom every family in heaven and earth is named, yeah. that he strengthen you with power through his spirit in yeah. your inner being. It started through prayer and praying and souls. Always. Always. Everything starts and comes back. No man is greater than their own prayer right. life. A man who's weak in prayer will be awake everywhere else. Hmm. And so they start this this prayer meeting, and in the prayer meeting one night, this, this young man who's the youngest in the group, he stands up and he says this. He says, brothers, it's hypocritical of us to be asking God to pour out his spirit when we don't have clean hands and pure hearts. He lifts up his hands and he says, yeah. God, is my heart clean? can't as ascend the hill of the Lord. Yeah. Right? yeah. Are, is, is, are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? And the power of God comes on him and he falls into a trance on the ground. He shakes violently. He falls into a trance. The men fall to their knees and they just begin weeping and confessing their sins to each other. The next day, culture in that village flipped upside down. Everybody, mind caught up on the things of God. They're showing up at church. They're wanting to be in a prayer meeting. And so wow. out of this... They say, the man that I saw in the vision, you must find him. And so the pastor believes it to be Duncan Campbell. They asked Duncan Campbell to come. <laughs> it's a it powerful like story, yeah. powerful <laughs> story on how he gets there. Duncan Campbell arrives, comes to the first meeting that's there, and it's a prayer meeting. He's blown away. There's 300 people praying. Before, just a few weeks earlier, there's only 200 people in the church, now 300. And they are crying out for a move of God. Duncan Campbell just greets them. It's his intention. He's not even there scheduled to preach yet. He's just saying hello. And as he's on his way out the door, the same man who prayed in that prayer meeting, he stands up, interrupts Duncan Campbell in his path, throws up his hands to heaven and says, God, you promised that you'd pour out your spirit on dry ground. Again, the power of God comes on him. He falls to the ground in a trance. 
Duncan Campbell, this isn't his theology. He doesn't understand this. But at that moment, the back doors of the church swing wide open. Come on. A blacksmith is standing there, and he says this. Um, he says, where's the pastor? You have to see this. And so Duncan Campbell, the pastor, a few elders, they come to the back door. There's 600 people outside the doors of the church. It's 11 o'clock at night asking if they can come in. Think about that. Where'd they come from? Half of them were young people. They were at a dance. They'd been drinking. Um, they'd been partying. It was a worldly environment. But a, a spirit of conviction came into that dance hall. Nobody wanted to be there anymore. And so they all empty out of that. They see yeah. the lights on at the church, and they start making their way towards the church. Others, families that had gone to bed, they feel something's happening in town. They wake up. They see people moving towards the church. The lights on at the church. And so they get their family ready to start moving in that direction. 600 and all. The blacksmith that night became a worship leader. He said, let's start singing a song. And so they're worshiping the Lord outside as they open the doors of the church. The 600 outside joined the 300 inside. There's now 900 people packed in this church. Duncan Campbell's... Small church. Small church. <laughs> Duncan Campbell's working his way to the front, and as he's doing so, he's not even sure what to do. I mean, come on. They don't prepare you for what happens when revival breaks yeah. out before you preach. About 11 p.m. <laughs> yeah. you're not ready to preach. Yeah. And so Duncan Campbell's on his way up. There's a school teacher. She's at the very front. She's beating the altar, and she's saying, mercy, 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 Lord, is there still mercy for me? Campbell realizes God's given the altar call. He's called these people already to gone. himself. It's yeah. already mm -hmm. happening. And so he just simply facilitates what the Lord is doing. And so those people, they stayed until at least 4 o'clock that morning. Duncan Campbell, he just facilitated that meeting, realized that he wasn't needed, just slipped out to retire for the night. And as he's doing that, they say, Mr. Campbell, we need you at the police station. What's wrong? Oh, nothing's wrong. There's 450 people outside the police station right now. And so he gets there again. They're crying out to God, weeping, confessing their sins before the Lord. That revival lasts for three and a half years. It starts, why? Because of the prayers of two people who got a burden, yeah. and they begin to pray. My friend, I don't have to wonder what kind of burden you're underneath. All I have to do is just listen to you. Come on. I just have to listen. To that. It's, uh, Joseph Carl said, according to the weight of the burden that grips you is the cry that comes from you. And so if you want to know what is it that really just listen to what you cry out for, that's what you're burdened for. And the church today in America especially has lost its burden mm -hmm. for a move of God. And when we reach that place that we are gripped with the, um, the hurting of, of those that are around us, and we begin to cry out to him once again saying, God, would you come and visit us with a fresh move uh, of the Spirit? I believe that he's ready to answer. Why? Because revival comes as a response. And we don't, we don't have enough time to even get into another story, but there's something that I'd kind of like to talk about if we can. Um, I, I'm reminded of an image back, I don't know whether it was in Bible school or wh which church meeting it was that the Lord gave me this image. Um, but I, I want to say we were praying for power or something. And it was like, oh, just send revival and power and that kind of thing. We were just really going after it. And I just got this image in my head of, of uh, you know, a gear a standard stick shift. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And, and the engine's going a certain speed and then we're in the wrong gear and we're just grinding gears. God is heaven and earth are like the gas pedal and the gear shift. Yeah. And God, and we've got it's our job to align our gears to where heaven is. Yeah. And I think sometimes we want to experience the peace of God or the power of God, and, and God is wanting to do something else. And, and I think that even as you're speaking, these men of God expected revival to look like this, but it was their, it was their responsibility to shift into what heaven was doing and what God wanted yep. to do on the earth. Yeah, I'm, I'm convinced. In fact, I think that right now, prophetically, where we are in the body of Christ is in a shift moment. I believe that, um, you know, uh, what is it, Isaiah 43? You said 43, 8, 40, early. 40, 44, verse 3 is okay. uh, pour out your spirit upon dry okay. ground. 43, verse 18, this is a familiar passage. It's, you know, a new thing that I'm doing. Do you perceive it not? Even mm -hmm. now it springs up from the ground. You know, rivers in the wasteland, rivers in, uh, in the desert. Um, what, what I believe the Lord is asking us to do is to forget the former things right now. And to open our eyes and realize that he is at work and he is moving. And oftentimes we miss it. Why? Because we have an expectation that we set by what we've experienced from the past. And listen, whether it was good or it was bad, it simply brought you to where you are. But I'm telling you tonight that your future is not in your past. That God's not looking behind you to figure out what's ahead of you, and he's not asking you to look behind you to figure out what's ahead of you either. He's asking you to set your eyes upon him and to pursue him with everything that you've got. And so we're in that moment right now that I believe that we are seeing a, a dramatic shift. And here's what I believe the Lord is speaking to us about in our own ministry, is that in that moment that when we begin to experience the shift in our life and we begin to see the river begin to flow, because Steve used to say there are times that you carry water 
you know, you carry water to people. And then there are times that the water carries you. Yeah. There's Man, that moment good, that the yeah. river begins to rise and you realize, yeah. I just need to surrender to the river and what God is doing. And I believe we've come to that place to where now we can expect mm-hmm. things to happen. I mean, what happens whenever a river enters into the desert? The environment has changed. What wouldn't produce, what wouldn't bear fruit before, mm-hmm. now can. Why? Because the means for life is finally here. Yeah. And if we'll perceive and realize that we're in a different different environment than what we used to be, we'll begin to recognize that things are different than, than before. And not only that, that this blessing that comes upon us, it's not just for us. Scripture says in that moment that the jackals and the ostriches and the wild That's creatures right. will benefit from it. What's he saying? He's saying because of what I'm doing in your life, it's those that don't even know me are going to become a beneficiary of what's yeah. happening on the inside of you. And I believe that's what's that's supposed good. to happen in our churches, yeah. that God begins to move in our churches in such a way that our neighborhoods don't even realize the blessing that's just yeah. entered into the neighborhood because yeah. of what the church Amen. has grabbed a hold of and allowed to begin to flow through it. Right, because yeah. he pours out his spirit on all flesh. Yes. Right? Yeah. Like With, not just the redeemed flesh, all of it. All he's, of look, it. he's looking to call a people into himself. Well, that's what yeah. we've been, I mean, honestly, I, we've been, I've been sensing in our church even, Man. you know, I mean, even this last Sunday, and I don't mean because you preach so don't get a big head i won't but uh you know but just, they invited him back i can't take credit for it yeah you know it looked like it was really i've that, never heard of this before good. i have never heard about this before i mean like it, josh is preaching on sunday and i'm getting text messages from people and it's like man josh is tearing it up it today was, it was you know, the holy spirit was moving and yeah. then and then uh pastor floyd who i was just uh, doing dinner with he says yeah, i've asked josh to do part two and so yeah. I've, he's invited you back well yeah. you know we were in the middle of it and and they began to play i think they did a worship song and then they did the next song and i mean when the song started reckless love everyone i mean everyone Something I happened. To everyone everyone in the room was like i mean you could just we we're about to get slammed we're about to get bombed by the holy spirit yeah i was like i'm gonna go ahead and lay down in advance so i don't yeah. like scar my forehead and bust my head open or something so yeah, yeah. i just got in the floor so let me ask you this pressed into god like i haven't would you two not, minutes be careful would, would you not call that a revival moment yeah 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 i, I wonder what it is in our churches that we're waiting for like we're we're expecting this spontaneous moment that suddenly we're going to be able to say that no, revival, God's doing stuff. revival is here without recognizing what we started this with, and that is if revival is his arrival, if revival is not a season, if it is his presence and we recognize that his presence is here, then we do we not have the opportunity when we're in that moment to recognize that what we've been praying for is here, and so now we simply need to steward what he's placed inside of the house. Yeah. If Paul said to Timothy to fan the flame, that's inside of you from the laying on of my hands. If we can do that individually, can't we do it corporately as well? And he says, he says, some have not done this and their life has become shipwrecked. Yeah. Right? Like hold fast to the prophetic word that was given to you by the laying on of our hands. And and I think as a the reason, you know, people yeah, people have been applauding and way to go, Josh, you've done a good sermon. But but that sermon could have been preached in another house and it would have not been received. Yeah. Um, Pastor Floyd has done a phenomenal job of cultivating a hunger and a, and a community of love uh, and humility in the church. And mm-hmm. because a word like that was released, uh, because he's created a culture of prayer and honor, um, that that that. I was able to wake up and the Lord impressed the scripture upon my heart that I needed to preach. I mean, it's it's so much more than than one evangelist like Scott, Cam- you know, Campbell or or uh, Francis Asbury or yeah. all these other great men of God. It has to do with the community, the body of Christ coming together, rallying around Christ yeah. as as King. And, yeah. and, and you said when he when Christ shows up and there's right place on the throne, that's that's when revival takes place. Yeah, and if we'll simply steward that from moment to moment. I believe that every time that we come together, that fire should grow. And when that does, then we begin to realize we're not waiting. In fact, let me say it this way. We continue to wait on revival, but the truth is revival is already waiting on us. That's right. God's just waiting for us to embrace what he's already doing and begin to steward that in our houses and let it grow. And you can do that individually. You can do it in your home, and you can certainly do it corporately. Okay, we got 60 seconds, so I'm going to wrap it up real quick. Jeff, any any 10 second thoughts? Yeah, just uh, I just feel like we're in a place of, like you were saying, that the Lord has already begun to do things and we need to steward what we've been given right now. And I'm talking as personally, me mm-hmm. and you. So uh, maybe I could sort of share that off of air. But <laughs> no, no, that's good, man. But yeah, that's just what I'm, I mean, that's just what I'm, I'm stewing in right now. That's so, good. Yeah. Well, everybody, thank you so much for watching us. Um, <laughs> our program is on every single Monday night, 8 30 p.m. Central Standard Time. You can tune in every single Monday night to watch us. You can go to our website to watch all the reruns and episodes we've done in the past at theremnantradio.com.
Uh, I would really encourage you to tune into some of our, our next broadcasts that are coming up. We have a Trinitarian conversation uh, with Scott Harrell. We've got a conversation with Chris Estrada on, on uh, what is Chris is coming on? Chris is coming on to talk about kingdom identity. Joel Stockstill is coming on to talk about leadership. Uh, so be on Facebook. We'll be doing some graphics that we post and you can share those things. Uh, engage with us. Please ask your comments and questions before the program. We can get in there and talk about that stuff. So I want to thank you guys so much for tuning in this week to The Remnant Radio. We'd love to see you next week. Follow Daniel website. DanielKNorris.com and trailoffire.org. That's it. Okay, you guys be blessed. Love y'all. You have a good night.